very nice to have you here with us today to talk about AI in Singapore. I'm Denise, and I work in Google on partnerships in AI initiatives. Um, so, like, it's, it's right after lunch, and uh, this is a time where our human intelligence is probably at the lowest levels. So, <laughs> I want to do a quick exercise and play a little game with you, like, just for, like, two, three minutes. So, can I ask everyone to stand up? <laughs> All right, so, I'm... I'm going to ask you like uh, three quick questions. Uh, if you want to do a little stretch now, feel free, go ahead. So I'm going to ask you three quick questions. And if your answer is yes, you get to sit down. And I promise you no trick questions and no special AI effects here. So <laughs> first question, so who of you is already working in AI-related areas? If yes, please sit down. Well, I am, but I'm standing. <laughs> and the second question is, uh, who is interested in exploring opportunities in AI? Good, almost. Wait, wait, hang on. <laughs> I was going to ask a third question, like who walked into the wrong room? I guess not. Everybody is in the right place. So very good. Happy to have you here with us today. All right. So um, thanks, uh, Jasmine, for doing the introductions with our panelists today. Um, I'll just, uh, we'll just be talking about AI in Singapore for the next half an hour. And we'll have another 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. Um, so let me start by asking each of our panelists to talk about what they do in AI, like in one sentence. Okay, hi. Um, I guess everyone can hear me. So I'm uh, Han Yang. So I work uh, in uh, Ensign Info Security. So the, my scope of work actually um, us uses AI in the area of cyber security, which I think uh, all of y'all know there's a lot of uh, cyber threats coming up. Yeah, so that's my area. So I'm uh, Ho Te Kwa, um, run AI Singapore, which is a national level research program hosted by NUS. Uh, hi, I'm Alvina. I mean, I'm from GovTech, the Science and AI division. My team is called AI Platforms. So the focus of my team is really to build and develop data science and AI platforms that enables agencies to use data driven approaches for policy making and uh, service delivery. Okay, my, my name is Yi Chong. Um, I work in DSO National Lab. So we are a defense R&D lab um, in Singapore. Um, my team, um, we built uh, robots, few robots with uh, um, AI um, capabilities. We also use AI to solve other data, uh, data problems as well as making things more effective and efficient for national security purposes. I see a lot of familiar faces sitting at the back and um, just want to say hi to those that I know. All right, thank you to my panelists. So uh, let me start by uh, asking a question. So, you know, like many countries such as US and China are also aggressively pursuing AI. And I'm sure many of us wants to know what is so unique about Singapore that, uh, you know, that position us well to do AI. So, um, you know, like, Elvina, do you understand? Um, so in my view, I think Singapore is well positioned because I think our uh, government is quick and nimble to act. Uh, making Singapore a good test bait to test and deploy any sort of AI uh, solutions that will actually enable Singapore to provide a blueprint for all futures uh, deployment for AI. So let, let me just, uh, this will my answer will be a little longer than what she wants, but let me just try to say in three different dimensions. So the first one is about AI strategy. I think we, we in Singapore, I think everybody believes that Embracing technology, including AI, is the way to grow the country and the way to go forward. So we now have the PS and Chicken who's chairing the task force look at AI, national AI strategy. AI Singapore is a, is a platform that was formed two years ago by the government. They put in a significant amount of resources, I would say nine digit, not eight or seven digit. And the goal was to actually accelerate AI adoption in Singapore. And second, Areas about talent. I know that everybody thinks that Singapore is a small country, but I actually look at simple facts to get you guys can't get the same page. I look at all the researchers in Singapore, uh, how many papers they published in the last five years. There were 3,000. Of the 3,000, there were 3,000 authors involved in those 3,000 publications. If you look at those who are locally based, about 400. So, in a way, actually, the talent pool is not just based in Singapore because Singapore, Singapore has a tradition of working globally with different partners. So if you look at the entire ecosystem of people working with Singaporean researchers, 3,000 people working in AI, which is not a small. And we don't have to be good in every area. If we choose to be a niche area to be well, and we'll be doing very well. The last thing is about data. I know a lot of people think that, oh, 
uh, Singapore is a small country, the data is not enough. I disagree. So I like to think about data. I work with a lot of data with AC, Nielsen, and so on and so forth. Data, there's a data cube. Think of data cube. There's one dimension called number of people. We only have 5.5 .5 million people. It's small compared to China and US. The other dimension is I call it time. How many pictures you take a snapshot? We have a lot of snapshots. I can say that Singapore has a long tradition of keeping data, so the number of snapshots is long. The other dimension I think we're going to be very good is number of variables that you take a picture, like in finance, healthcare, in education. So we can use the NRIC number, which Singaporeans will know. You can link all the data set together in a singular gigantic data set. I don't think any country has that differentiation across the different domains. So my take on that is, is that our USP, unique selling proposition, is going to be both data, because we have a comprehensive data set, talent, because we have a traditional working globally with different talent pool. The multiplier could be 10, like 400 to 4,000, right? And finally, I think because we have this unshakable belief that AI is the only way to go forward, and we are really investing heavily in it. Let me stop here. Well, thanks, thanks, Prof. Ho, like for talking about you know how despite being a small nation, we still have like good data and good talent to do AI. So let me now dive deeper into the promising areas of AI in Singapore. So what would you say are some of the promising areas of AI that we have in Singapore? Okay, so um, uh, maybe I'll just say from the ensign security perspective. So again, um, like everyone knows that like cyber threats has you know risen. Um, you know, unprecedentedly over the last um, few years. I mean, uh, right now, like hacking incidents is like very common nowadays. You know, from companies to even individuals. So now we are talking about you know really whether AI itself can help us to detect some of these uh, more elusive cyber threats. So which is why I think um, back a few years ago, um, uh, the group of us uh, actually started to try to apply some AI techniques to detect some cyber threats and again like if you talk about Singapore itself um, you know we are always at the forefront of innovating you know we want to try to sort of um, um, produce some uh, good um, solutions and all that so again um, there are a lot of opportunities in uh, cyber security and especially for AI which helps to marry two very deep disciplines so um, yeah I mean uh, moving forward I will expect that's a lot more um, you know, solutions that's coming out that marries AI with uh, cyber security. Yep. So we actually, AI Singapore just launched a grand challenge in healthcare. I know healthcare in the US is almost impossible to get data and we're able to work with Ministry of Health. They have a group called IHIS, which is the one in charge of IT. So we're able to get data for many, many patients with chronic disease uh, from high blood pressure, high cholesterol, uh, diabetes and so on, and we assemble the data set. We uh, combine with the reimbursement data for for getting money back from the government subsidies and so on. Also link it with diagnostic data with all the X-ray and so on. So the data set is huge, and we're able to gain access to that and put it in the a secure micro access lab that allow researchers to go in to gain access to that. And to me, uh, I really believe that Singapore can really make a name for itself in health, big data, AI in healthcare. And we are looking into different possibility of getting people to live longer with less disability. For example, one of the challenge statements is very clear cut. How do you reduce number of cases of complications resulting from high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and uh, high sugar level? Our goal is to drop it by half, which is like 50% drop in five years time. Hopefully in 10 years time, we can actually almost get rid of complication completely. And uh, so each one you work in defense, like what about in the area of defense? Okay, so um, the defense area um, sees uh, the challenge um, slightly differently. Um, as we know that um, Singapore faces also a demographic um, challenge. Um, we don't, um, people that are not born 18 years ago, uh, today they, they won't be able to take on like security uh, operations or serve national service. Or, and, and hence, actually, I think in the, in the security and um, defense uh, area, there's a severe uh, problem of uh, having not enough people to, to do uh, jobs that are increasingly complex and challenging. So um, the way we approach it is 
And one of the biggest way to solve this problem is just simply to make either machines smarter to be able to help in decision making or to make uh, machines uh, do things better so that our people can focus on you know, higher value chain and higher value jobs. So um, I'll give an example. So, um, you know, um, we used to um, be very concerned about um, people intruding into restricted areas. Um, for example, like um, the, the Jurong Island. Okay, and uh, because it's a big petrochemical facility. And, and, you know, in the past, you probably need people to, you know, patrol the area, you know, put, use um, sensors, binoculars to look out for potential intruders. And this probably has to go on day and night, 24-7, and it's very strenuous for manpower. But now that we have introduced, actually, um, video analytics, um, AI algorithms to uh, not just detect, but better recognize, you know, uh, suspicious uh, intruder intrusions. And from there, then we trigger the necessary people to respond to them. So it drastically changes then the, the nature of the involvement of the limited manpower that is now deployed to really just respond to uh, you know, critical incidences instead of having to burn time you know, looking at sensors 24-7. Um, so that's one example. Um, another example will be, I'm in the area also in, in robotics, so, and, um, and people know that actually we have been moving into um, use of unmanned uh, ships to to do more like you know dangerous tasks like you know you need to look for maybe dangerous things in the waters, and um and you know in, in order for ships to, to operate in uh, autonomously in a uh, very very congested waters around Singapore, so you need to be pretty smart right to avoid you know other vessels, and hence you know the, the developing the AI in the vessel to be able to do that is a very critical piece of solution, and we continue to improve the robustness and the smartness of these systems so that then you know, the, the, the operators do not have to sail continuously in our waters to cover a big area, but they, hand, they can look at what the, um, the autonomous vessels are detecting and hence respond to it. So these are just two examples of how I see AI making a significant impact in the way we change, the way we do uh, things in the defense and secure, national security area. All right, so it sounds like there's a lot of promising areas, like from cybersecurity to healthcare to defense. So I'm sure there must be a lot of challenges that you faced as well, like in doing AI in Singapore. So can you share like some, what, what are some of these challenges that uh, you have in doing AI in Singapore? Um, okay, so for me, I think Prof already mentioned on the data problem. I think for me, it's not so much as a problem, but uh, something that we need to overcome. Um, so I think um, in terms of train uh, label data set for any sort of machine learning for Singapore data set, um, it is still not that sufficient. Uh, even though we are working on making uh, data access and data uh, readiness uh, something um, to be looking to, to be looked forward to, so that's on the data problem. Uh, the second one, which is a little bit more of a worldwide shortage, which is in terms of data talent, which Prof also have mentioned. Um, I for Singapore we have. A, a fair number of uh, AI talents, but uh, by and large, the AI giants are still associated with the tech giants in North America or in China. Um, our index, uh, AI research index, is very good. Um, so I'm hoping that we can actually attract more people to come back to Singapore <laughs> um, to either either work with government or even in the startup. Last one, which uh, potentially might be a challenge for AI adoption, is really the market for AI startup in Singapore. It is primarily still smaller than a lot of the other countries. Um, so any form of AI startup must minimally go regional. Yeah, so that is one of the challenges that I think um, the companies as well as the government in Singapore faces. So, um, so Prof Ho, what are some of these other challenges? How well, are we overcoming like, these let me challenges? Just, let me mention two things. So one of the things that I'm always worried about is this, that you have fantastic technology, but but the citizens and average people might be afraid of the technology. How can you figure out an AI solution that touch many people's lives? So one of the re reasons why we launched the first challenge in healthcare in chronic disease domain is this, that we, we know the base rate of people having that disease is very high. If you are 60 years old, your chance of getting diabetes is about one third. And if you don't have it, your family member will have it. Uh, so the reason why we work on those those are domain is this that we hope to energize the whole nation on relevant application of the AI that improve people's quality of life. And I actually think this is one of the things that we need to do as a country 
So that uh, I actually like to kind of quote uh, Ng Chikun who, who, who talked, he said, to your face kind of AI, like you have an AI that to your face you recognize that you have been helped by a technology that, that is so pervasive that everybody can appreciate it. And, and people will reduce their barriers and fear about the technology. Second thing I really believe that Singapore, one thing we need to really overcome, I call it data liquidity platform. Just like stock exchange, you have very liquid, that means a lot of people are trading it. So you think of a platform for data, if you are, the platform is there, but it's not liquid. That means very hard to gain access to data. That's not very powerful. So I really think that we can make a, a, a big kind of push for getting our data to be liquid and yet it's secure in the sense that it's uh, privacy preserving so that we, nobody will be upset we, when we share the data. It will be very powerful for Singapore. And uh, I'm hoping that this actually is not just a policy solution, but it's also a technological solution we need to develop. Whoever can figure a way to make data liquid at the same time secure and trust, trusted will be very powerful for, for the country. What other ways are we doing to um, overcome some of these challenges for AI? Well, I think this morning, um, many of the people seated here have heard um, the panelists talk about um, talent. And I think, um, well, I agree with one of the panelists who mentioned that the talent pool, which we see as a, it's a global talent pool that, you know, um, that, side, that moves around in the ecosystem and helping each other to solve the really challenging problems. So um, how, how, how at least I see going forward um, to solve some of these talent pool problems is that we really have to have the spirit of collaboration. And every organization um, who's, having, who's looking into building AI capabilities in a very you know, sustainable and serious way uh, should think collaboration in a very big way. Because um, you can never hold all the AI talent to yourself. And, um, I, I, and I speak from the perspective that, you know, from a, from a, a defense R&D organization, okay, I see that we, the, the biggest way that we can actually push um, the, the breakthroughs and the solutions that we come up from AI for some of the very challenging problems that we face is actually through collaboration. So maybe people might find it surprising that, you know, we actually collaborate and, you know, a, great, a lot of, with all the professors, you know, the academia in the international uh, in a very big way, so the many of the publications that we made were with the various you know AI you know, experts around the world, and there's no problem publishing some of these breakthroughs because that's how you, people then uh, you know ideas generate new ideas, and that's how we consist consistently tap on this global talent pool. Then from there we can actually start to customize these solutions through the industries and through the development teams, um, and we can actually you know start to really adopt AI AI in a very very big way. Um, without having to keep all the talent pool to ourselves. Can I just expand on that point? So even at uh, my the other job is the provost of NUS. So we now allow professors to take 50% with the company, 50% with the university. We're totally cool about it. Because we know that there's no way if you want to keep that 100%, they're not going to stay with you. They are, they are constantly tempted with challenging problems in the industry, uh, high salary even. So... So we are extremely open, and another possibility is for the government to allow the GovTech employee to be 50% industry, 50% government. I think they should be open about that too. So, so and I, I, I couldn't emphasize it more. While we are small, we have a culture, a tradition of working globally with talent pool. In fact, I actually just give you a statistic. Uh, NUS has 9,000 publications. About 7,000, we work with international collaborators from 136 countries, including some of the very remote countries that you never thought are possible. So that tradition is always there because we have been small and, and we haven't grown bigger. So we've always been trying very hard to work with uh, our partners globally. Yeah, and uh, working globally is a very important point. Like this morning, we talked about how we can unlock the market potential for Singapore, like be to Southeast Asia and beyond to the world. Um, so in this respect, like for AI, how can we bring like this AI technology that we have to Southeast Asia and beyond? Okay, so maybe I'll just comment on that. So um, basically for Singapore, um, you know, again, like there's a lot of constraints, but yet you can see there's a lot of opportunities that just blossom. 
So again, as uh, what we you know, decided to take the step of building a smart nation many years back, I think there's a lot of potential for Singapore to, be, uh, to become the regional uh, cyber hub. So again, from the cyber security perspective, there's a lot of uh, untapped market. And again, uh, with all these uh, hacking incidents, it's not just uh, only applies to Singapore. Like every country is facing similar kinds of issues. So if Singapore is able to sort of build a re relatively good solutions, there's a lot of opportunities for us to move regionally uh, to offer such services to the neighbors around us. Yeah. So let me mention, let me mention two things. One is in healthcare. Uh, I'm aware that in China and India, the incidence of diabetes is as bad as Singapore when you hit the same age of 60 years old. So whatever solution come out from the Grand Challenge will be exported to those countries to help those countries to live longer and better. Second thing, we are extremely excited about AI and education. Uh, Singapore is famous for having a very good educational system and a lot of our courses, our math and science is being exported to other countries. So we are thinking very hard about launching a grand channel in education. Whatever we develop using AI, we'll be able to export it to Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, and China too. Right, and uh, so many of our audience here today, they're very interested in opportunities in AI because they all sat down just now. And uh, so what would you say are some examples of interesting job opportunities for those who might be interested in AI? Okay, I think uh, in the spirit of, uh, I think both the panelists mentioned just now, uh, in the spirit of collaboration, um, I, I think for AI, for, uh, for in order for AI to grow in Singapore, we really need to collaborate um, globally. So for GovTech, we have the Smart Nation Fellowship. We also have, we have also started a mentorship problem, uh, program where uh, we reached out to the Silicon Valley. I think some of you are here today. And these experienced engineers will actually uh, mentor um, the engineering teams. Um, in addition, we are also open to working with startup. Uh, one of the products that we developed uh, recently for whole government speech to text was actually done in collaboration with a Silicon Valley startup. And they really impressed us in the short time that they took to adapt their engine to the Singapore corpus in a short time of about two weeks. Um, so we actually successfully developed something like that as a quick prototype for agencies use. So there's a lot of opportunities and quite a fair bit of challenges if you are an engineer or researcher for uh, for you to be in Singapore, because I think the, the, the problems that you see in Singapore is somewhat unique. Um, so if you like challenges or you like uh, transfer learning, uh, this is a good place for you to be. Can I, can I actually just ask the question, how many of you guys want to be professors or academics uh, when you the next few years? Anybody? I saw a few. Please send me an email, tck at nus.edu.sg. I will definitely reach out to you back and very quickly within two days. Uh, how many of you guys want to start a company, uh, start an AI company? So AI Singapore has an AI maker space. We will invest in startup, at least 100 startups. So if you are interested in startup in Singapore, please contact me to same email address that we will be seriously give you a, a space, a server space with data and tools and allow you to do startup and we'll invest in those startups with uh, VC together. Okay, how many of you guys want to implement AI solutions or technology? Please raise your hand. Okay, AI Singapore is going to invest in 200 companies working with them to implement AI innovation. We need people, please join me and send me an email again. I'll link you up to all, depending on which company you want to work for, we have about, so far we invested in 30 companies. We really need engineers who can implement solution. My biggest pain point is, is that what happened? No one implement though. They just get my money without implementing a solution. So I need people who I can trust that will make things happen. And I trust you guys will do the right thing for Singapore. So please send me an email. As I say, either professors, startup CEOs, or engineer or manager managing project. We have 200 projects for you to manage. And contact me. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Take out your pen and pencil. What's your email again? <laughs> So, um, how about Han Yang? Like, any other thoughts on interesting job opportunities? Okay, so I think like um, Popo mentioned, there's a lot of exciting things that's happening. So, again, for myself, uh, you know, I chanced upon cybersecurity quite a few years ago. So, um, I'm a data person. So, basically, learning up the cybersecurity um, space is uh, ch challenging for me. But yet, I think there's a lot of uh, 
um, you know, good use that uh, all this knowledge will come to, especially to support Singapore's uh, smart nation uh, vision. So I guess like, you know, all the budding um, engineers and the entrepreneurs out there, you know, I urge you to just come forward and just, uh, you know, offer your skill set. I think there's a lot of uh, interesting problem for you to solve. Yeah. Any bid for defense? <laughs> okay, that's a tough one, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, for DSO, um, one of the things that we do, um, we hire um, Singaporeans. So Singaporeans who want to come back and contribute to something non-profit, something, you know, for the greater purpose of defense and national security. Um, yeah, we're here all day and people want to talk to me, um, to understand a bit more about, you know, the opportunities. Um, feel free to, to come look for me. Uh, but on top of that, I, I think we also offer many challenging problems that, that is thrown um, open to people who are startups and technology implementers who want to come up with solutions. Um, because not, we don't solve all the problems that we know. I mean, it's not always possible. And many of these, I think the better solutions can be out there. And that's where we are very interested to you know, talk to more people and collaborate to find you know, solutions and, and that, that can help either the, st the startup that you're working you know, through a uh, prop hole. And then you know, we provide you know, problems and, um, so, and then you can look at the solution space and then we can actually have a chance to grow more and more solutions that, uh, that, are, that is based off Singapore and it could be something that you can then ship off to the region. Right, so this is not a recruiting talk, right? In case you're wondering <laughs> if you enter the right room. So, um, so well, we think that uh, there's a lot of difficult questions you can ask around AI, and I've asked all the easy ones. So I really want you to ask the difficult ones. And uh, open the floor up to ask questions now. Right, so uh, I'll just repeat it for people at the back. So, um, and I'll just like shorten it. <laughs> so, uh, so you're asking about what is the ethical considerations, right? And like, given all the privacy consider uh, concerns and all that, how do we can, how can we like do AI like safely, securely? So, so I think, I mean, in many ways, we're gonna be, we're not gonna be like like China. We will never be like China, which basically leveraging on data that they can do a lot of quick implementation. I would say you were to ask me to guess with more like the European country who care about privacy a lot, but we had to do it through two ways. One way is through technologies that used privacy preserving analytics instead of just pure analytics that you can do. It's a promising field that we are investing heavily in. The second thing is through policy and, and governance that we are, we are actually working very hard towards that. So whatever implementation we have, we're going to be very careful about that. that privacy and so on and so forth you're mentioning. So I, I would actually, I don't know what the future is going to be like, but I'm pretty sure that Singapore, would, in many respects, would be the trusted place to implement AI solution and test betting it because we really care about both. Implementing it at the same time, we care about secure and trustworthiness as well. Yeah. This is for Professor Ho. Um, can you expand more about AI and education and expansion opportunities in Indonesia and Vietnam and what you had mentioned? Thank you. So we. Uh, AI Singapore have been, in many ways, invest in a lot of AI education outreach. We have four different programs now. One is called AI Apprenticeship Program, which you are, after you finish your degree, you want to be an AI engineer. We assign you to a real application project with at least half a million dollars worth. You work with a company, make it happen, and they might just hire you as a result of that. And most of them could range from startup, medium size, to big company. We also have AI for industry. These are people who are engineers, who have technical background, but they go through a three-month intensive training in AI. I see those people, are tend, we call it AI enabled, right? You know how to embrace AI technology, but you can't produce a solution. So we also AI for everyone is a way to get people to be not afraid of AI. It's like AI aware. And we also AI for students, even for secondary school students. So we're trying to figure out a platform that we can reach out to Indonesia and other countries so that we can actually make it portable. Currently, the AI for industry is quite portable. We work with the, uh, Intel and a bunch of other companies that, that is mostly online, a fraction offline. And uh, you would ask me the most not scalable piece is the apprenticeship program that work on real project. 
in the city so we'll have about 100 projects at any point in time then we can train about maybe 300 engineers every year which is not very fast but it's kind of reasonable hey, this question to uh, professor ho also so my name is glenn uh, i'm going to say you are the co-founder of uh, ai startup so my question is i heard a lot about the software and application but uh, is there any like a policy or anything to do for the hardware, especially given you know Singapore is still the major player for the semiconductor, in, uh, semiconductor industry? So anything we can you know help us to build like a presence in Singapore for the AI chip? We actually, when we uh, when we invest in those company, we the only requirement we have is you have to be based in Singapore. It doesn't have to be a Singaporean who owns the company. Does it make sense? So we do work with many startup that. They are actually non-Singaporean who run the startup. And because the idea is just that when you're there, you grow the ecosystem, you help Singapore as a country, you hire engineers who are based there, right? So we don't have that problem. And so we do have people who work in smart system and robotic. Uh, we do have people who work in flexible electronic that actually power some of the IoT sensors. So there are a lot of professors who work in the engineering side of it, which is the IoT, the flexible electronic. I will have people who work in electronic skin who who are figure out a way to actually figure out technology that's mat advanced material with AI kind of intersection. So we have a lot of people doing that, but most of them are in, in the university. Uh, I think quite a few, not many. I mean, we work with a, a company called Applied Material, which is the largest semiconductor equipment company. They just set up a corporate lab with us, $100 million project. Uh, we are working on how to do semiconductor in the AI way, uh, using machine learning and so on. A hand in the back of the room. Good afternoon. Thank you to all of you who are speaking. Um, just wanted to ask a question to any one of you guys who can take this. Oftentimes, uh, working in AI or data science, um, our big, biggest problems tend not to be, tend, in addition to ourselves and the data, tend to be people who use the data um, as part of the, you know, Product, product managers and things like that, people like that who are in not necessarily coding, but part of the vision of creating an AI product. Um, given that that is really crucial to our work, um, how do you guys plan to tackle getting the talent of product managers who know how to do AI in? Um, I think for, yeah, no problem. Uh, for my team, uh, we have product managers. Um, not all of them are technically trained uh, as an engineer or a uh, computer scientist. I have found that the best product engineers sometimes are the ones who can relate best to people's problem, uh, but yet at the same time understand what are the uh, benefits that AI or even data science can bring to the agencies. Um, so once if you get them on their side, uh, I think it is by far an easier battle to fight than um, trying to shove it down their throat. So that's my strategy. So let me just kind of answer it with a three C. So, so uh, the way I think about AI is always there's a data captures the capture piece. There's a computational piece, which is the machine learning, those people who do algorithmic work. There's a creating solution, which basically people who create, based on our algorithm, create solution, create value. So. So you were asking the biggest bottleneck is the bridge between create solution and computation people. Uh, your point about product manager who are the creating solution piece, a lot of time they don't understand what AI people are doing, which is the computation piece. I, I think it depending on domain, I would say that in healthcare, for example, it's much easier for the uh, computation people to understand healthcare than the reverse. And for, for example, marketing, for example, it's much easier for Computation people to understand the domain because the domain is much easier to understand. So, I, I think you all you all vary, but I think it is true that in Singapore, the biggest pain point I saw about implementing solution in AI is always the bridge between the computation people and domain people who create solution for their customers. Another question. Hi, I'm following up here on the previous question. Um, and this is more like a, I guess, like a bigger picture question. Um, you, you know, it sounds like Singapore is pretty much in that stages of acquiring the talent, building the infrastructure, and then collecting the data and so on. So that's still kind of in an early stage. And if you look at the successful companies, what they've managed to do very well is actually putting all these pieces together. 
And um, so, you know, cultural factors come into play. And I wonder, and, and often those who have managed to do well is because they take a very focused strategy. So you've shared a lot of the opportunities, uh, initiatives going on in Singapore. Do you feel like top down, there are certain priorities that we want to go after? Or are we going to do more like a bottom up approach where we want to create that environment and then see, you know, maybe, uh, May the best succeed. Um, little comment there, please. Uh, okay, I, I'll, I'll, I think at the end of the day, it will be a combination of both because I think the government is pushing for some big use cases that will change the entire country, improve the people's life, and create a lot of industry and company. But there are also people who are not interested in those use cases. You have to give them room to grow. So we're going to use the bottom-up push for those group of people who might see the future better than the government or not so clearly, we don't know. And so I, I would say, I think, if you ask me the first order approximation is just that I think currently we have a lot directed top-down a little bit so that we, because we are small, we want to be focused. But I think we will also leave room for people who want to be bottom-up too. I, I always I invest in 30 company. And the 30 company, maybe I'll say three thirds actually is related to what the government want to do. The other one is their individual who are interested in certain things, they will just support them and let them grow. If they can survive, it's good for us. What about Han Yang, you're in cybersecurity. And do you feel that you are a priority? Okay, I, I think like um, for cybersecurity itself, uh, my own experience is uh, definitely um, it's not uh, going to be smooth uh, because you are really, really finding like flaws in systems and all that. So again, um, you know, yeah, I mean, wh whether you like it or not, uh, it's a tough push. But again, you know, there's a lot of um, real use cases that, uh, you know, the, the, the field of AI can be applied to the field of cybersecurity. So um, again, like, you know, like all entrepreneurs, when they all started out, it's a tough path. But again, like hopefully, you know, you'll see some light at the end of the tunnel and really, really um, the impact is going to be immersed. This is uh, my, my, my own thoughts. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Um, another question? Singapore has an AI framework and one of the principles are fairness. So how do we define fairness? Do we have certain protected classes that we look out for? And for each product that we deploy, do we see how, do, how these people you know, interact with the product and whether there's any discrimination? Huh? Can you can you repeat that? You want to ask like how we do fairness? Oh, okay. So, so actually, I'm I actually I, I do research in that, so I'm passionate about that because AI machine learning need data. If human exhibit biases, that is unfair. They say unfair hiring practices, unfair you know uh, interviewing processes. That you use those data, the machine will become biased too. But there's a group of researchers who are trying to de-bias it. In fact, because you can capture it in a machine learning way, you can try to identify potential biases so that you can correct those biases in the real world and also correct the machine too. Uh, it is a very exciting topic. I have quite a few researchers at NUS is working on that. Try to de-bias unfairness in the data that happened naturally occurring in the human nature, right? Uh, I would say uh, we have we are not tackled that in a serious way, but many researchers independently working on small projects like that. Personally, I'm extremely interested in unfair hiring practices in in the world, like any like recruitment or engineers, for example, and so on and so forth. We we have one question, right? Um, hi. So um, so thank you all for um, the insightful advice. Um, so my question is, so from the panel discussion, I'm seeing the pattern of um, applying AI f to solve local problems, for example, like AI for defense. Um, and when it comes to data collecting, Singapore definitely has total control over um, the data that internally comes from Singapore. But um, for those who wants to uh, build their AI solutions and scale it to a more uh, global level, they might need data um, that comes from, say, other countries. And we, when it comes to that, um, like how is that being addressed uh, from your experience? Or are there any um, like, you know, challenges when it comes to like, collecting data at a large scale that come from many sources? Yeah. Maybe um, I, 
I'll take that for a start. Okay, so, um, so since you mentioned defense, I thought I'll just take that question first. So um, some of the projects that we do, um, we collaborate, say, with um, ETH Zurich, and um, we collect certain data that it's open, and we share with openly with them, and we do joint research, and the research is published. But at the same time, we also make sure we add in diversity to use data sets that's open for like, you know, the Kili data sets and all these are very famous data sets, both as benchmarks as well to add diversity because the buildings looks different, the roads looks different, the, the, you know, the trees looks different. And that's how we um, ensure that there's some element of this research first ensures um, diversity. And second thing, it allows us to work openly having data sets that we work openly with people so that we can all you know, contribute to the solutioning. So you don't have to protect all your data. I think although we, we talk about data as a precious commodity, it's like the new oil. But if you do have data sets that you can put on the table and you can work together and collaborate on it, I think that's one of the first, the easiest and the most impactful way of just you know, contributing your AI talent pool together and solve useful problems. So I, I, don't, I think it can be managed very, very uh, well and very, very easily. I think this happened in healthcare too, by the way, because we have been exploring with UK, so AI UK on doing chronic disease uh, conditions. How can we share data set that whatever they do there, we can replicate it here and vice versa. So healthcare is kind of a common domain that many doctors have been working together to tackle major disease, infectious disease and so on. So. Uh, there's this culture of partnership uh, within Singapore and many other countries. So uh, we'll take one more question. Yes. Hi. Um, my question is about actually right, a data more. sanitization. So um, some time ago, there was a study done with uh, publicly accessible data that I, I'm not sure if it's IMDb or Netflix. It was an entertainment provider that released uh, data for the purposes of uh, data scientists to use for a study. And uh, somebody actually uh, managed to deduce all the identities of the anonymized data in the data set to match to real people. Um, how are they? Uh, how is data being sanitized in Singapore's data collection? This is a very. Uh, I'm not an expert in privacy preserving analytics. Uh, there are people who work on that. In fact, in 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 Singapore healthcare, we are very very careful. So. What we do is we build a micro assess lab that, that is located with the premises of the university that AI Singapore is hosted. And we only allow people who are pre-qualified to gain access to the data and, and they have to do it in a proper way. So, so currently we are still trying to push the envelope slowly and incrementally. We are not so brave. So we are doing step by step and trying to make sure that whatever we do is kind of in line. But you're quite right. Uh, a lot of time you can figure out a few variables, you can back it out what the person is. Like I give you an example, in Singapore we have 40,000 babies. You divide by 365 days, you have only 100 babies a, a day. You divide by the zip code, like 60 over district code. You probably know, if you, I know your address, I know your date of birth, I know who you are. As, as simple as that, right? So all those things come in and we, we, we are very careful. So I have to say, we wanted to be selling as a trusted partner for data sharing, right? We're working towards that, but, but your, your question had to be a technology solution, actually. There are, uh, for example, there are ways to perturb the data without disturbing the mean. For example, that can, I can perturb your date of birth by plus or minus 200 days, uh, two, plus or minus 100 days, then you can perturb it, and then you can change the address too. So there are people who work towards the kind of, the kind of encryption and, and uh, privacy-preserving analytics kind of algorithm. Yeah, and uh, you know, I know there's still a lot of questions, but uh, we're actually running out of time. And before we end, I would just like to ask our panelists on their response for, for one question. Is that, what is your vision for AI in Singapore? And uh, please stay in one sentence, kind of, because in true Singaporean efficiency fashion, <laughs> we don't have to. So I'll start with me. My dream is to, to see AI to be so pervasive in Singapore, everybody can feel and touch AI technology in 10 years to come. Okay, for me, I think uh, as what uh, Minister Vivian has said in the morning, is to create more trust for data sharing and to make Singapore not only a smart nation, but a more secure smart nation. 
Um, for me, my vision for AI in Singapore is really to uh, have Singapore become a global hub to test and deploy AI solutions and towards the vision that this will actually allow uh, Singaporeans to have uh, move out the uh, job uh, value chain to have better jobs. And for me, I think um, AI, we're just you know, looking at AI from a very, uh, hopefully we can see AI in a very ubiquitous way so that everybody has access to it. It's no longer just accessible to um, you know, a limited group of individuals. I think it will really benefit the Singaporeans in a, in a very big way going forward. Well, thanks uh, to our panelists. Um, please give a round of applause. And uh, thank you to all our audience. I hope you continue to think about what you want AI to be in Singapore. And uh, you're, f you're free to get the Professor Ho email now. Please. Thank you. <laughs>